You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to The Buzz, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezik, and today we are buzzing into episode 61 of the only Native Plant Podcast that's going to somehow wrap together aspirin, New York City, and invasive <laughs> plants into a cohesive <laughs> message, uh, and keeping it in less than an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said an hour and a half and not an hour. I was going to say an hour. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to make another I'll, promise. I can't I'll, live in <laughs> I was waiting for the pressure to be on, but I'm hoping it's co- cohesive. We were efficient last time. We and uh, that's our goal again. We, we Last time, last buzz, I said we were striving to make the perfect native plant podcast. And that time, I think we got a little closer than we normally, but maybe we're yeah. 50% there. Actually, the last one with Nate from Mount Cuba, we were that was, really... You know, and I think it, we we weren't allowed to get off topic because we knew we had limited mm-hmm. time, you know, and it was actually like really nice and tight, even though oh, there yeah. was more things we pro- we could have easily talked for another half an hour. Oh, I was thinking like another two hours. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but. yeah but it's I'm I'm happy with the last couple episodes that we've been able to tighten it at all. Yes, tighten it up yeah. a little bit. So. And we're going to deliver on that again. I'm making right. that promise. We will deliver and keep it. We won't get too far off topic. But, uh, all right. All right. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So keeping it on topic. um, Yeah. Let's get into the the plants that we're vibing with this week. And that's hot. That's hot. Would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So um, this was a tough choice for me because as, as on the record, I've said my favorite native plant at least once in our first episode, maybe, uh, maybe again in, in, later episodes too but i've said my favorite native plant is liatris spicata yes and uh and this is where you really got to joke in the winter we complained that we yeah we didn't have a lot to choose from and uh now we really have to juggle and i'm and it's holding blooming. out hope that it's going to be blooming for another two weeks so i can yeah. use it next time because there's something else that i had to use instead it's in full glory right now oh too. yeah yeah it looks really really good um so if you if you haven't if you don't have liatris spicata near you that's something that you should look into if it's native to your area because uh, this is one of my favorites, but the plant I'm choosing is just starting to fade away, and that is Spirea tomentosa, uh, which is also known as steeple bush. Very nice choice. And um, and just it's not too far, a couple of greenhouses down from our main office, and then just walk around the nursery. It's one that really stood out over the last uh, last couple of weeks because it basically does get these purple steeples. I yeah. guess is a great way to call it. Why I got the name of the plant. You have these these conical, really slender conical blooms uh, that are like a pinkish purple that are just come right off the top of the plant. It's not that tall of a of a shrub. It's only two to four feet tall usually, yeah. and um, it just provides a really unique texture. It's deciduous, so it's not going to be evergreen. Uh, so it might not be the best thing to put if you want evergreens around the base of your house. But if you add it into some other evergreens, oh, you can have a really cool plant there that adds a really unique texture that you're not going to get. Uh, for many other species. I agree. That and its counterpart, Spirea latifolia, mm-hmm. which is meadow sweet. The, the two of them, there's not, when it comes to native shrubs in in the Northeast, there's not too many lower native shrubs. And and they're staying, like you said, that two to four foot range. And they have a softer texture to them. Yes. Kind of yeah. kind of like what you would picture the exotic Spireas to look mm-hmm. like. It's It's a little more softer in texture a really nice bloom like to me it's a really nice intermediate garden plant yeah um and it it, it adds a lot it's i i like the fall color so that's a great mm-hmm. choice yeah it's and a- i also found out just from looking it up i've always wanted to know what the, the wetland indicator status is and that for this plant is uh is a facultative wet so it likes a little bit wetter but it can, but handle, it can it. handle it yeah. fairly dry too and even how we grow it in the nursery we're growing it fairly dry totally, totally um and then it's the larval host of the columbia silk moth Ooh. which i haven't looked up the columbia silk moth but uh but it looked like a moth wow so <laughs> nice you know i got no interesting facts about my plant as i was just looking over what i had written down in the notes i didn't have any good facts this week but i chose this plant because every time this year your brother will make some 
uh, cut flower arrangements, and he always includes it, and it always is striking. And that's uh, Veronica from Virginica, yeah. which is Culver's yeah. root. Uh, blooming now, it's it's mainly white to a pale blue uh, spike, uh, very reminiscent of Veronica. I think Veronica Castrum even means like Veronica like or something mm. like that. But uh, again, that's another uh, facultative wet. It does get on the taller side, about five feet tall. So wherever you're planting it, give it some space. Uh, but it makes a great cut flower. Um, it does tend to like, you know, it's only it's a full sun to light shade. If you put it in heavy shade, it's going to flop mm. over. It's one of those tall ones like. Uh, cut leaf cone flower like if it's not getting enough sun it stretches mm -hmm. and you just start getting flop yeah. and it's a pain but. again it's another plant with that it's oh, now i'm thinking about it the flower shapes are kind of similar yeah. even though this is an herbaceous plant and, yeah. and um my choice is a shrub but it has like a long slender cone shaped flower with yeah. little well i guess the the stem is like that but then the little flower buds coming off it. it's a really neat looking yeah. flower and it it really does look in like native wildflower bouquets because you can i don't want to call it filler because it's not filler no, but it, it provides like that, a nice little just pop to it it's yeah. you know a lot of the things that stand out at this time of the year blooming you have like purple cone flower you have uh liatris mm -hmm. you have um rudbeckia like you have a lot of blues and pinks and yellows so it's nice to add that white in there That's, just for I, contrast. you're not it's not there for the color it's more there for the texture yeah it as it's a textural component like liatris is um mm -hmm. in addition to having color but uh yeah so it's a, a cool plant that i just planted some in my garden earlier this spring and they're little so they didn't really pick up any I, flowers this year yeah but it's I, a cool plant i plant it i plant it one late last fall in agatha's property and it's it's little and it's probably not going to bloom this year but yeah but our seed field which is blooming right now and I took the long way to work because I had to go get gas on the way and which means I drive past our, our seed farm and oh man that's the whole farm looks awesome right now but that species it's just kind of tiered between I can't, I can't it's something yellows in front of that or no it's the liatris okay. in front of it then you have um the the veronica castrum right behind it which is a little awesome. bit taller and then you can see the purple cone flower behind that and then on the other side of the driveway, you have the, the Heliopsis is still blooming. There's some more yellow awesome. stuff going on in the back that was a little bit out of view. So it's it almost looked like a, a, a fancy painting with all the different colors and, and vibrancy of the, and we're having a bluebird sky day today too. So yeah, it, it was it really helps. cool driving by that way. But those are two great choices. I think uh, you can't go wrong with either of those. If you don't have either of those in your garden and they're, they're native to where you're at, I would think about both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And they both play pretty nice. It's not something that's going to be aggressive. I that's agree. Foreshadowing <laughs> way, way later <laughs> in the episode. So moving on, we're going to get into this week's botany based current events. Of course, we always make this a competition. Uh, let's get into this or that. You can get with this or you can get with that. So this was a close one this week. Extremely close. But there is a winner. And the winner is... Man, I just squeaked this one out. 12 to 11. I was the saw final it. Vote. We kept going back and forth. And like I was a little ahead. You were a little ahead. Yeah. Uh, apparently, my link didn't work for some people. So uh, that, uh, I guess we'll, yeah. Fair and square, you won. But yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it was close. I know that at one point it was 10 to 10, 11 to 11. Like it kept, I would, go up one and then it would tie and i was i was getting nervous i didn't want yeah. to lose three in a row but, <laughs> three in a row. but you did have a really good article so and that you. was um respond or having a proactive response to Super invasive basis. plants and uh, a little bit better than my opinion piece from the new york times new york times having a paywall and not looking out for the little guy in me yeah <laughs> you know and i <laughs> trying to win this kind i didn't even think about that like when i put the links in the show notes, like I never test them. I just put the links yeah, and in. And you want to know what about. is uh, sometimes they open up and sometimes they don't. And it seems sometimes it seems like if you open it up on your phone, they'll work. And if you open it up on like a desktop or a laptop, they don't. Yeah. Um, I know I've had other things where if you went directly to the URL, it doesn't open up. But if you go like through like a link through Twitter or a link through something else, it'll go that way. Yeah. So it's, these people, people way smarter than us are, <laughs> are figuring out how they can get like a couple bucks from us a month so that well, we can pay to read these articles. I'm happy with the the, the voter turnout more mm -hmm. than anything else. Yeah. Like that, that's a lot of votes for us. Yep. And uh, I think that was, to me, that's important that people actually are listening yeah. and reading the stories and, and yeah. want to play along with it. And us, I, so. again, I'd like to thank my author, Margaret Renkel, for writing an opinion piece that's yeah. 
you're going to be published in the New York Times, which yeah. is one of the most widely read papers probably in the world. You need that. So, yeah, need it's it's great just to have that exposure, and we're glad that that it's happening. And there's a lot of great articles, and that's the hard thing. Like a yes. lot of these articles are really good. Now, this week I chose one that I thought was interesting to me. I don't know if our listeners will find that interesting, but I'm going to choose to go first yeah. since I yeah. won. And then uh, I don't know. I like going first for some reason, but. Uh, mine is uh, by Curtin University on phys.org, and the title of the article is Study Finds Aspirin Takes the Headache Out of Restoration. Um, and I, I've highlighted a few paragraphs that I'm going to read instead of paraphrasing, but new Curtin University research has shown how a readily available, cheap, and safe-to-use product found in the medicine cabinet of most homes could be the key to better ecological restoration practices with major benefits for the environment and agriculture. The study revealed that aspirin, which naturally occurs in the bark of willow tree and other plants, can improve the survival of grass species important for ecological restoration and sustainable pasture when applied in a seed coating. Uh, lead researcher Dr. Simone Padrini from the ARC Center for Mine Site Restoration and Curtin School of Molecular and Life Sciences said that salicylic acid has been used for medicinal properties for more than 4,000 years, and its uh, modern synthetic version, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, or aspirin is one of the most widely used medications in the world. Our research has found that aspirin can do more than just ease a headache. It can also help restore degraded land and ecosystems and establish sustainable pastures through improving plant growth and survival. Uh, the study was performed on native perennial grasses and showed that applying a low concentration of salicylic acid to the seed can improve plant survival and therefore its effectiveness in reaching restoration goals. Now, they, they did go on to say that they need to do more research other than just pasture grasses. That was, that was their uh, control study uh, to see how it reacts. But I love that they're using a natural means to improve, which makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. it, it makes oh, yeah. total sense. You know, we've actually, we always look at, you know, when we pick our that's hot, we're always picking articles and we, we list the medicinal uses. Of some of these plants which have kind of fallen to the wayside but mm -hmm. aspirin's one that that we've known for a long time has healing properties so why wouldn't it have healing properties yeah and for uh, the environment? like seed coatings have been used for well, at least decades now yeah. and it just makes sense that using something like this as a, a seed coat or as an additive or well, even add, additives at the time of planting have been yeah. but they tend to be synthetic or um well at least as far as i know a lot of them tend to be synthetic so yeah. Uh, no, this seems like an interesting use that that I'm very interested to see what their next line of research is. Yeah, and I'm curious too if it it sounds as if they're using the natural uh, salicylic, not mm -hmm. the uh, synthesized. So I'm curious if the synthesized version has the same effect too. Mm -hmm. I would like yeah. to see a control study between mm -hmm. those two just to see if you get the same type of of growth between the two. But I I love that they found the natural. Uh, of something occurring naturally to help in restoration success and i hope i i hope to see more more research in this yeah no no that's a great article and uh but speaking of aspirin and something yeah. that you need to relieve headaches yes. one of the things that always gives me a headache is going to new york city and uh <laughs> <laughs> and i know we actually have a bunch of new york city listeners <laughs> so yeah. i'm sorry for picking on new york city so much but I found a really cool article um, by way of LinkedIn, and it was uh, Lucy Rubino, who's um, uh, one of the employees at the Greenbelt Native Plant Center on Staten Island. Works It's a division of New York City Parks, works a lot with New York City Parks. And I think she shared it on LinkedIn, I'm pretty sure. But uh, it was an article that was titled uh, Saving New York City's Last Wildernesses okay. and uh, by Sarah Charlotte Powers, and uh, published about a week or a couple, two, two, three weeks ago in the Scientific American. And uh, basically, I didn't know this, but added up the natural areas in the five boroughs of New York City equal more than a dozen central parks, which is just an outstanding number because you go to New York City and yeah. like most people, they're going to Times Square, they're going to Broadway, they're going to the, the skyscraper yeah. Yeah. areas. You aren't seeing these natural areas like we talked about with, with um, uh, Jason, Jason from, from NYRP. Now, yeah, NYRP. Yeah. Uh, too many NY. <laughs> NY, NY, whatever, court yeah, and all this stuff. And, but, and, you know, and I think part of it is, even though it is in the city and in the, the five boroughs, like yeah. when you go to Casino Park or Corona Park, mm -hmm. you know, you're not 
sometimes I think maybe if you're not from New York City, you're not equating it as part of the city. Oh, maybe yeah. That's, yeah, that's definitely. It. And like I, when I go to New York City, I'm not going to these places. I yeah. guess if you're from New York City and you know about these places, yeah, um, it's a great place to to go and, and utilize. And that's what a lot of people did during the, the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. Um, like I, I guess it's still going on technically. But if you think about things like Jamaica Bay, uh, you know, yeah, things yeah. like that, like I'm, they have to be including the mm -hmm. the shoreline yep. as natural areas. And, and, and that would make sense if, once you start. So, like, yeah. So a lot of people during the pandemic were going to these, these natural areas because they didn't really have anywhere else to go. Um, but these natural areas really are, are understaffed and underfunded. There's not a lot of money being diverted to, to these natural areas like there was to um with like giuliani i think they referenced yeah. in the article well then it was hey we're going to put a lot of money into our our keystone parks we're going to go to central park and um uh what's the the other big one in brooklyn uh we've sent a bunch of plants there but i can't remember what it is prospect, <laughs> prospect, prospect, park. prospect park yeah park. so we're going to focus on these like big parks that are, are kind of the cornerstones of what people think of these big communities yeah. in New York city, that's where we want our money to go. And then de Blasio said, no, we need to pay attention to our local parks and started going into like the little playgrounds and little just corner lots where they had a, a, a swing set set up, yeah. wanted to revitalize a lot of those. Well, we're going to have not weird, but New York city is going to have a new mayor coming up. And um, Sarah is calling for this next mayor to focus on these natural areas because of the pandemic proved how important they were. And uh, a couple expert excerpts from uh, from this article as uh, every year, more people visit Jamaica Bay, which we just talked mm -hmm. about the sprawl. And that's the sprawling wetlands around JFK Airport. For those of you who have flown into JFK, that's what you're looking at, which is actually a national national park. Oh, I yeah. Believe. yeah. Yeah. So more people visit there every year than Yellowstone, Wow. Um, which you think about <laughs> people are going to Yellowstone and then say, oh, more people are going to Jamaica Bay. That's crazy. Wow. So, uh, as I mentioned, next year, New York City will have a new mayor, and he or she will have the tremendous opportunity to leave their mark on our natural areas and make us nat a, a national model for saving the wild, wild places that offer us the greatest escape, face the greatest threats that ha and have the greatest benefits as we prepare for climate change. Uh, they will need to act with urgency through sea level rise, infill encroachment, and lack of active management. The last wild corners of New York City are disappearing. We lose six acres of wetlands every year in New York City. Uh, and that's an area the size of Madison Square Park in Manhattan. Uh, the roadmaps, the Natural Area Conservancy, which is where Sarah works, um, I've gathered from the article, uh, has developed for our local forests and in recent weeks our wetlands uh, call for major new budget investment, uh, major new budget investment, hundreds of millions of dollars over the coming decade. And that may sound daunting, but it's the same scale that the current administration put behind its own signature park initiatives. So. Uh, it's achievable here in the nation's largest densest city, and it's a viable template for cities across the country to transform our natural areas into healthy, vibrant, and popular park destinations. Awesome. And, uh, and even going back a couple of episodes ago, to, uh, one of the Buzz episodes, the article I had chosen was about um, a similar thing, people going to the parks during pandemics and finding that the wildest areas of the parks gave people the best therapy really and yeah. like seeing a bald eagle had more of an impact than seeing a squirrel you know <laughs> it, was, and, it was those kind of things and what's interesting if i remember correctly don't quote me on this that when mayor bloomberg did the million tree initiative a lot of mm -hmm. it was because they realized that as the city grew for energy purposes they needed more of that natural area to help shade and protect because they might get maxed out as far as uh, manufactured energy goes. Mm -hmm. So they needed all of those resources to help with the kind of growth they were getting. And they figured this was the best way to do it. So there's a, so many, you know, we always talk about the wildlife, but we need it as well. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's oh, for yeah. us as much, you know, mm -hmm. and mentally, like you just mentioned for and, your own uh, mental even, health as well. Even reading the the article there, uh, the author's talking about going on hikes in, in Brooklyn and, and kayaking in Queens. And um, I know in Staten Island, they have all these kayak canals and stuff yeah. with um with fresh kills well was yeah. a landfill now it's a park and uh yeah so there's a lot of really cool things in new york city that kind of get they get lost from an outsider's mm -hmm. perspective because you aren't like well, yeah i would much rather go to new york city and and kayak and or, well, or do that kind of stuff than go to uh and fresh kills is just opening right that's just i, I mean that's so, been yeah. years and years in the making but there's also uh pen and fountain landfills mm -hmm. also so there's 
you know, that's, that's more natural area that you can add to that. So yeah. it's that mm-hmm. they're, they're revamping and making available soon. So that's a wonderful art article. Yeah. So I'm hoping that, that this next mayor of New York city, uh, whoever he or she may be does listen to this and, and start at least invest in some way to some of these natural areas a little bit more than has been done in the past, because it's just getting more and more important as time goes on. So I agree. I agree. So two great articles, uh, we're recording early next week, the buzz. Mm-hmm. So we, we only have a week to vote. So where you typically get two weeks, this is going to be a one week, yeah, yeah, one week turnaround time. So um, I actually didn't reshare the, like typically we, yeah. we share oh, yeah. it to bump it up, but I didn't because I was winning and I didn't want yeah. to bring any <laughs> and I've, to, I've meant to too and I forgot. Um, but if you do want to vote, you got to join our Facebook group, which is just Native Plants Healthy Planet on Facebook. Yeah. You'll find us there and you just scroll down until you find the post where you can vote yeah. on the articles. We'll have links to the articles in there. And, yeah. uh, no, and no. there's usually a little bit of banter uh, between voters yeah. on what they thought was better too. Now, not to rub salt in the wound, but you actually had a, one vote on Twitter. But it doesn't uh, technically yep, count yep. because, you know, yeah. so. sorry, you know, occasionally we would get one on YouTube, occasionally get one on Twitter, but it's got to be in that Facebook group. So yep, exactly. For those of you that don't have Facebook, I apologize. <laughs> but we're trying to keep it, trying to keep it fair that way. So, um, you want to do listener shout out? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Listener, listener, shout out, shout out, shout out. Would you like to go first? Or yeah, you... yeah. Okay. So I got two emails this week. I, well, I've got a lot more than two. <laughs> <laughs> but I had two emails that were almost identical. Um, and they both happened to be from Tennessee. Wow. And they were both looking for native plant material and um, and wanted to know of resources near there. And uh, so I was uh, Mark Walker and Jake Feldy. Mm-hmm. Um like I said, both from Tennessee. I think they even both said they were from Eastern Tennessee. So, uh, but I gave some references that from from people we've talked to from Kentucky, and um, uh, we'll, we work with Roundstone Seed yeah. in, in Kentucky. Uh, now I'm blanking on the name of the the nursery that um, <laughs> I forget who it was. I don't want to say it was Bluegrass Nursery, but it was something oh, okay. along those lines. Yeah. That was also in Kentucky. And then, uh, then there's Tennessee Valley Natives. This is a newer nursery in northern Alabama. So I'm not super familiar with that region and how close or far a lot of this stuff is. But you, there are some options that have been popping up yeah. there um, over the last couple of years. So, awesome. And speaking of that Tennessee Valley Natives yes. in Alabama, uh, he's a, a big TikTok star now. Speaking of oh, our own TikTok, yeah. or two weeks ago, um, and you know, like thirty some thousand followers on TikTok, but he just on TikTok put together a list of native nurseries all across the country. So, Kyle, if you're listening to this, we want you to share that in, in our Facebook group too, because that's what a great resource that is, just to have like a compiled list, and you can find them online too. But uh, so the, the more these lists are out there, the better it is for for people to find them. So. That's awesome. Do you have a TikTok update? How are oh, we? I, 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 I don't. Um, I, all right. Last time I yeah, looked, I it was know. going pretty steady. <laughs> yeah. You know, we looked like we were yeah. doing pretty good. No, there's, it's like I said during that episode, like I'm not on TikTok, but and I some of the stuff I thought was a little bit annoying, but you hear the songs enough and you're like, oh, yeah, it would be really cool to have have this thing where it's like, oh, yeah, we're talking about like milkweed and then you put milkweeds yeah. into this music. That was kind of my thought behind it. And then my wife just liked the idea ran with it and it's like everything she's putting up is exactly what i was awesome. thinking awesome. um i just didn't have the skills to to actually do it so so no it's, of, it's going really really well as far as i know speaking of updates before i forget because i know we didn't really we normally talked about at the beginning shirt update uh not a lot of change since okay. we're recording early in this yeah. week versus okay like later in last week so it's about the same I, we might have sold a couple more since All then. Right, but, awesome but there's a new design that went up end of last week oh and then there's another one that i'm about to release probably today or tomorrow well, it might be next week i'm about to go on vacation so okay we'll, we'll see right. when i get it done it might even be today so maybe by the time you're listening to this yeah, thing, yeah it's yeah. already been okay awesome so, but this, this is one i'm actually like really proud of and and uh well, i guess i'm proud of all of them but this is one that's a little bit more creative than just the words that were on a lot of the other shirts it's more awesome. artistic oh so oh i need to look all right awesome you ready for yeah for let's, questions? let's get into questions I want to ask you a bunch of questions. I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? Man, we're killing. Fran, before yeah. before we go too far, did you say your listener shout out? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I was just going to say, man, we're killing it time wise. That's because I'm just skipping over everything. <laughs> Oh, oh, I guess I should do that. So um, so I was going to mention, and, and you probably have more information on this one than I do, but Cynthia Blackwood from the nonprofit Friends of mm -hmm. High School Park. I know we have an employee that went to a, a volunteer event, mm -hmm. and she had mentioned uh, to Noelle that she was a fan of the podcast. And I know she reached out to you, actually, yeah. oh, about yeah. us maybe coming out there to do a, a live broadcast, which we're not set up for yet. Yes. Like we're, yeah. we don't we don't have the equipment for that but yet. But just hear Noel talk about that um, Friends of High School Park and uh, and then talking to Cynthia. It sounds like a really, really cool park. Yeah, I guess there was a high school there and they blew it up. Not not the Friends of High School Park. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. The city the, blew up the park and then, then they or the, turned, high or the high school and then they turned it into a park. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I know we've been dealing with them as a customer for, for yeah. a long time, probably yeah. since I've since I've started here close mm -hmm. to it. So it's, so, um, but yeah, they have a big focus on natives and, uh, and that's their native plants. And that's, that's awesome. So. so we appreciate everyone listening and, uh, and your interaction. We appreciate that because we, I know we've said it multiple times. Sometimes when you don't get the interaction, you start feeling like you're in a vacuum and you don't know mm -hmm. if what you're doing is hitting the point or not. So we love hearing everyone that listens. And, uh, even if you're just dropping a quick note, like, Hey, I'm, I'm a listener and I enjoy the podcast. It means a, a whole lot to us. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. All right. I guess now we can do yes questions. Yeah. So I'm not going to replay the thing, but we had two questions. Awesome. Neither of which are Saul. Oh, even better. That's two episodes yeah. in a row with no Saul. You might want to check in on him. I'm thinking I have, that. you know, I said I was going to the last one and I didn't. I should probably check in and make sure Saul's okay. I'm wondering if he's recovering from something. Yeah, could be. Which is possible. But one of the two phone calls is a familiar voice. So mm -hmm. I'll play that one secondly. But let's start with the first one here. Hey, guys. I uh, love the podcast. Uh, my name is Heyman. I'm from the Atlanta, Georgia area uh, and have been into native plants for about four or five years now. Um, wanted to ask a question about seed starting. I uh, wanted to honestly would really just love if you guys could do a seed starting episode. Um, this was my first year where I, you know, started from seed. I uh, didn't have a lot of luck it planting directly in the yard, um, but I uh, had more luck seed starting in trays. Um, but my experience is primarily with uh, vegetables, period. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that's it. Uh, and so I think that really sort of sums it up. Um, I don't think the knowledge is really transferable from vegetables to, um, per, uh, perennials and, uh, native plants. I wanted to see if you guys could help me out and give me some pointers. Um, I appreciate it. I had to cut it off because he says his phone number. Oh, so yeah, I yeah. actually listened ahead of time and actually <laughs> edited it out. So we, and this is something that I know we've discussed on numerous episodes. Um, the, mm -hmm. although my show notes weren't great, so looking back, I couldn't pick out which ones. Yeah. I know episode twenty six, I think, is one where is that where Carolyn called in. Yeah, I think we yeah we talked about yeah. it there. Um, and we do have a video that we did with Sourlands Conservancy mm -hmm. that kind of discusses um seed starting a little bit, like glossing. But there are a couple pointers. Mm -hmm. Um that we can point out. And and yes, there is a big difference between vegetable seeds and an herbaceous seed. To me, and, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, to me, two of the biggest things to know when you're getting seed and planting seed is, is it pure live seed? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, is every seed viable or is just a percentage of the seed viable? So you yeah. know that when you're starting and not all seed that you get has been stratified already mm -hmm. so some herbaceous seed when you get a seed mix may need a winter season or a cold season mm -hmm. or two cold seasons yeah. before it will um to break down that seed coating before it actually germinates mm -hmm. so a lot of seed mixes will have things that come up quick and then some that start to appear over time yeah yeah so like uh, uh the asclepius species are one that come to mind that they just need like 30 to 60 days in like moist soil or even like a paper towel in the fridge and uh and they'll come up pretty good like al almost every single if you have good seed uh just about every single one will germinate if you were just to go and plant those you, you're lucky if you get a plant or two to yeah. come up if you had 100 seeds there so um that's one in particular it just needs a little bit of extra treatment and uh the tough thing with the native plants versus 
and vegetables and there's a lot less research that's gone into it yeah and um and then on top of it is uh there's just so many different species with not that there's not a lot of species of vegetables but ten, people tend to say i'm going to grow tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and it's a variety of the same stuff and a lot of those are annual plants so they're meant to germinate really easily yeah. where when you start getting some of the perennial stuff it's uh, like baptisia is one that it just needs a lot of time to kind of break down that seed coat naturally that it can germinate yeah. um but the the step you could look at 20 different species and you'll have 20 different sets of instruction this one needs 50 days at this temperature this one needs 60 days at this temperature yeah. and a lot of the people are just kind of figuring it out they don't um they don't know it all yet so yeah so you know and it's and some people have the information and don't want to give it up because that's their livelihood as mm -hmm. well so sometimes it's a little bit of research if if you if you're on Facebook and you haven't joined the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group, please do and ask those questions there because our listeners are very willing to share their knowledge of mm -hmm. what they've had success. I know a lot of our listeners start seed from from seed mm -hmm. or start plants from seed, I should say. So they're willing to help with some of their successes and mm -hmm. failures. So um, I agree, though. I think uh, starting in trays or planters is probably – uh, it's definitely a lot easier because you can yeah. watch what's happening yeah. we're in the ground it's that was the other thing i was going to key in on is when you do stuff in the ground um you don't always know what's coming up when you do yeah. stuff in a tray and something's coming up you can say with uh pretty reasonably it's like okay this is probably the thing i planted yeah. you put it in the ground then it's okay this could be the thing i planted or something that blew in or something a bird dropped or something from, from all these yeah. other places so yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, maybe for a future buzz is what we do maybe, uh, like five tricky species and just kind of go through it's, we got to figure out how, what'll fit into a nice little package that we can say, oh yeah, these five species, or maybe it's three species, or maybe it's 10 that we can do in like a, a 10 to 15 yeah. minute span, um, to help troubleshoot some things for some people. Cool. So, I yeah. think that's a great idea. We can retouch that. So I do have a second call, um, I'm going to play that right now. Hello, boys. This is your old friend, Doom. Before I get to my question, I must clear up Pam the Desert Devil, the answers man's confusion about my motivation. Such a dark line. I am not Doom because I wish to spread me. I am Doom because I reflect the sorry state of affairs that humanity has brought. But speaking of sorry states, let's talk about the not so heavenly tree. Your excellent guest from the Mount Cuba Center mentioned vanquishing it. He did not go into great detail, but I am hoping you and your crack team of researchers can shed some lightning. I have heard that many methods are trying to control the tree and have been actually resolved in its prolific spread because it has such a rapid risk defense system. If you try to cut and treat the stuff, you will immediately send out armies of roots, suckers, possibly ready to get away from the mother tree, and the poison won't reach the suckers. Hack and squirt as well as foliar spray may have the same result. Rumor has it that basal bark treatment is the only way to fight. I'd hate for your listeners to do what I did last year. When trying to make wish it, use the wrong method after consulting the gurus. I'm paying for it this year. So any light Ning, you can shed would be gratefully appreciated. Thanks, boys, and keep up the good work. Maybe one day your continued efforts will exalt me to mere blue. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like Doom was recording in his bathroom that time. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's like a public bathroom yeah. getting that echo. <laughs> I like that that we could maybe get Doom to downgrade to gloom. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. the forecast. Yeah. It's almost like our our invasive forecast. Yeah. Oh Doom. yeah, that would be nice. But it made me laugh. Now, I don't know if you're a wrestling fan or any of our listeners are wrestling fans, but it made me think of the wrestler Mankind, mm -hmm. who named himself Mankind because of all the troubles with men. He was representing 
the troubles of mankind. Oh, okay, yeah. And that's why he was so messed up. So I wonder if Doom is actually messed up from our environmental woes. Yeah, that's maybe what that's it Doom's like. backstory. Yeah. <laughs> Doom, I need the Doom backstory. I think we need to go into uh, why Doom is the way he is. But that was a great question. It actually, leads us into our topic because we are going to discuss again natives, but more more or less de- defining mm-hmm. natives. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's. I don't have a lot of experience with getting rid of Tree of Heaven. And the first thing when when I thought of this is, oh, I'll Google it and see what most people say. And most of what you find out is is um, hack and squirt or just yeah. a foliar treatment. And that's, and, uh, and that's from extension. I'm, I'm not going to say oh, yeah. which ones, but that's from extension agencies, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, but um, and I think from what I read is they said it's, it's not like a it's a multiple year thing. You're not going to just get rid of it in one step it's going back and checking and it could uh, sucker out like like you're saying and then you got to just keep treating keep treating um until you finally get rid of it it's, but uh it's, but, each year it should hopefully get a little bit easier mm-hmm. you're treating it shooting up suckers they're smaller maybe not as strong and you're just slowly working it out yeah but the basal bark treatment was interesting because i've only heard of it and um but i didn't have a lot of experience so i just looked up a little bit and it was saying how uh it's usually used on bigger trees mm-hmm. because you can't get a foliar spray on them um, without hitting, hitting like everything around it as mm-hmm. well. So, uh, and it's basically you're using a, a dosage and you're just spraying that basically the base of the tree on the bark and, um, and it'll seep in there to, to kill the plant. So that might be a, an interesting way to take care of, of that problem. Yeah. Now so. I know when we had Michael Van Clef on from the New Jersey invasive mm-hmm. strike team from uh, friends of Hopewell Valley open space. Wow. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, they had mentioned, and I can't remember injections they were doing. They, they were injecting insects or um, herbicide mm-hmm. into the plant and they were getting really good results that way. Cause it wasn't affecting yeah. anything surrounding it. And just by getting those dead ones out, it was opening up light for some of the natives to compete. Mm-hmm. Um, against it and that i don't remember which episode that was but i know it was right before the new year i believe or, or like it was in december uh was the episode and i just don't remember the episode number i'll find it but... okay so it's it's not an easy one and that's that's why it's invasive that's why it's all over and and the woes with it being a host for spotted lanternfly it's a difficult one so hopefully Hopefully new methods come about. Like I was really excited to hear when Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space was using in the injection methods. Um, so hopefully that's, you may not have the means to do that, but hopefully that's a, a, a way to work. But, you know, as, as Nate from Mount Cuba Center mentioned, it's patience. It's, you're not going to eradicate it all at once. It's, it takes time. So it's, it's going in every year mm-hmm. and spot treating and, and hopefully over time, that issue gets better unfortunately there's no one and done with that one and if it's a larger area it's going to be too hard to be one and done anyway yeah and i wish we had more time to uh to reach out to nate or or reach out to mike Van Clef yeah. and, and get a better answer yeah than, than our, our broadcast approach kind of how we're we're answering this now that was uh with mike Van Clef, dr mike Van Clef from um, friends of hopeful valley open space and the new jersey invasive species strike team that is a mouthful yeah. Um, that's episode 32 and it was okay. just before Christmas. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. That was, I can't believe that we've done I was almost say, 30 episodes since then. That's I was crazy. thinking the same thing. That's, that's kind of crazy. I was expecting it to be in the forties, oh, but yeah. so, you know, one of the things that, and Tom had this idea, which I think was a great idea because someone had mentioned in the Facebook group, you know, and when we've heard this on numerous occasions, like, Oh, it's, I know it's not native and I've heard it's, it can be invasive, but I keep it in check in my yard. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to discuss, def, try to define what is an invasive, which is difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I have my interpretation of what it is. Um, and then we're kind of going to go through about a little bit how invasive spread, like all the different yeah. means that, yeah. that and can it's, happen. It really rooted, because, and it was um, uh, some of the gardening groups that I joined. And I really just joined some of these groups, not so much that I'm a gardener, but more to see what other people were talking about and get some ideas of things that we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, And not just native gardening groups, but like regular gardening groups, people who are not just focused solely on using native plants in their their home gardens or landscapes or restoration projects. And um, 
you know, one of the things that would always come up a lot, especially surrounding Japanese barbering, is the someone would post um, it, it's legal to buy Japanese barbering in New Jersey. It's not like uh, illegal like it is in some of our neighboring states. And uh, so someone would say, oh, I wanted to get this Japanese barberry and, and plant it. But um, uh, then they were just asking for advice. And you'd always get someone say, oh, don't plant that. It's invasive, uh, which is good. That's yeah. good advice in my mind. But then you have all these people would respond to that saying, oh, well, I have it all in my yard, but it doesn't spread at all. And people were, seem to be confusing the term invasive with uh, with something that's going to be an aggressive plant yeah um so an aggressive plant is something that'll be will spread yes where uh, an invasive plant just means that it's taking over natural communities yeah um it's something that is going to germinate fairly easily and then it can outcompete a lot of native plants uh when at least when there is exterior pressure on those native plants and it's not on the invasive plants Exactly. So that was like the big misconception that we kept seeing over and over is these people saying, oh, no, that's not invasive because it doesn't spread from in my garden. They're they're expecting to see a plant pop up right next to it or a couple feet away. Not something like with Japanese barberry where a bird's going to eat the, the plants on the seed on or seeds on the plant or the berries on the plant and then go fly over to a fence row or a, 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 can, a forest canopy and then mm-hmm. discard that seed there uh and it could be a mile away it could be more than a mile away you know one of the reasons like if you have a big silver maple in your yard Mm -hmm. and when those seed falls like it's prolific it it's it drops a lot of seed for you to think that it's not coming up so it's okay like or none of that's viable because it's not coming up in your lawn well you're mowing your lawn yes you're you're mowing you're actively uh, mowing those seedlings so that they don't come yeah, up with with black locust which is an, a native plant in the united states yeah. but it's not native in our area yeah. and it can be very aggressive in yeah. our area the northeast um i have a whole hedgerow that's full of black locusts and they drop seeds and i have occasionally if i don't mow for like two weeks i'll see some that actually pop up in the yard yeah. but i get them popping up in the front garden all the time i even have them like popping up in the cracks in uh in the the stamped concrete yeah. in my backyard yeah. i have them popping up through the cracks in my deck which is like two feet off the ground so the seeds are somehow making in there and then it germinates and it'll actually push through uh sometimes even as high as a foot <laughs> before yeah. i actually go and clip it off yeah but so these things even though and that's only so yeah it's, it's spreading and it's still spreading a couple hundred feet sometimes from the hedra but uh yeah, so you're maintaining a lot of those places. That's some one of the reasons you don't see some of the spread. Yeah, but uh, but things with berries that's going even further. Yeah, so. I mean you'll see them germinate in in gutters, house mm-hmm. gutters, because it's wet and they they're getting the right moisture. So it's it's just not sustainable yeah. there. So, yeah. but and backing up to yeah. define an invasive species, and this is from the the USDA Forestry Service. Um, it's defined as a non-native. Uh, it's non-native to the ecosystem under consideration. And whose introduction uh, causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So the the big ones we talked about Japanese barberry, something that, especially with deer pressure in the Mid Atlantic, it'll go from a cultivated garden space. A bird will pick up that berry uh, and eat it, and then it'll go land on a tree branch or land in a hedgerow and poop out yeah. that seed, and um, and then that seed falls, hits the ground, and it'll germinate because in our area you have a lot of deer pressure that are munching down the the native vegetation. So you have a lot of light getting to that forest floor um, or at least enough for that seed to germinate. And then the deer aren't eating that seedling. So it gets to grow big and strong while all the competition around it, all the native stuff is getting nipped off every couple of months from yeah. the deer. So to me, my interpretation of this definition is that if it's not native to the ecosystem under consideration, Mm-hmm. Even though it's native to the USA, yeah, it can be considered yeah an invasive. Yeah, by so, this definition, that black locust would be considered an invasive it's not native since here. it's not native to like for me green briar, which is not native to this area. Mm-hmm. Um, it's further south in here, and it's it's taking over. It's a little bit more aggressive than everything mm-hmm. else. That could be considered more invasive because mm-hmm. it's not native to this area. At and least I don't believe it. Is. Talk internally about um. Spartina altoniflora, which is a great salt marsh grass on the east coast, all the way down to the Gulf in, in Texas, um, but on the west coast can be aggressive. And I guess it's 
by this definition is considered invasive. Yeah. So, and for um, we've talked about this before as well. But when we talk about native plants, we're we're using I guess the conventional definition of plants that were here prior to European colonization. Yes. Yeah. So I guess technically it's 1492 when Columbus got here, um, but it's probably close to like the early 1600s, and that's when the massive or very very rapid yeah. expansion of some of these yeah. European and Asian plants came quickly yeah. to, to North America. And I know as far as what's native to certain ecosystems mm -hmm. in the U.S., those lines are blurred because of climate change. Like yep. I know some of those more southern species are creeping a little bit further north and some of the species that were normal here are creeping further north. So I, you know, you take that under consideration too, but it's, you know, you, you really should look at where you know, where these plants are native to, not just that it's a native plant, is it native to your area before you start using it? Because it might be something like we've talked about all the time, like something from the East Coast is invasive on the West Coast. So it's, you just have to be cognizant of that before you introduce something that you don't really see. Mm -hmm. um, because things that, you know, we talked about it, um, like common milkweed in, in Atlanta or in Georgia, yeah. you know, yep. that's extremely Can be aggressive. aggressive. There. You know, and, and things like, um, cattail are native yeah. here yeah and that's aggressive so that's common, aggressive. common milkweed's aggressive yeah. here and too but it's, those are it's aggressive. been commonly found yeah. here but they're native here so they can't yeah. be invasive they're yeah. they're aggressive mm -hmm. so uh, we're going by that so yeah. but i thought um it would be good to point out you you had compiled a great list of how invasive spread mm -hmm. um do you want to go through that a little bit yeah so i guess it's probably easy to believe a lot of this stuff is spread by birds yeah. Um, and many of which we've talked about before. Japanese barberry, I just mentioned, uh, you'll have one growing in your, your landscape out front. It gets the red berries. Uh, a bird will come in and kind of worm in between the thorns and eat the berry. Uh, Sidetracking Japanese barberry berries do not have a lot of nutritional content for birds. Yeah. Um, but they will eat them because really what else? <laughs> There's not a lot of other things to eat in your landscape. Yeah. Um, and then they'll take that that berry and then poop it out someplace else and you'll never even know that it came up a mile away unless you happen to be hiking that trail and say oh did that one come from my house or my neighbor's house or the or one of the other houses that has it around here yeah so so, so like three of the the worst ones yeah. are are spread by bird so uh bradford pear japanese barberry burning bush are all um and japanese honeysuckle as well and yeah. uh, a bush honeysuckle too yeah. i think they'll eat the berries and, and spread that way but that's not the only way that they can oh, spread yeah. so yeah. one um and this is one we talked about with nate from mount cuba is rose of sharon which is more wind dispersed mm -hmm. now i mentioned in Agatha's yard, there's at least 20 rows of Sharon's, none of which she planted. Mm -hmm. uh, this past weekend, I was surveying the neighbor's yards as well, mm -hmm. and everyone has about 10 to 20. So yeah. who, who yeah. knows where it originated? I don't think anyone there knows, mm -hmm. but it does spread because it's there's a natural area in the back of everyone's yard there. So it's oh, all yeah. in the yeah. non-mode areas along along mm -hmm. the backyard. So. Yeah. And uh, and it's just blew in from someplace else. Someone had one. They put it in their landscape. And it's, again, it's a common in our area. It's a common landscape plant. Yeah. Um, some friends of mine asked where where they can get it, and I'm like, oh, you probably shouldn't get it. But yeah. Uh, I, like if you want to get it, just go to a garden center. They'll probably have it. Yeah. But um, yeah. And it just someone got one, and it just blows. The seed will blow. And I I've heard I read that there's some sterile varieties. Uh, um, and I always take that with a grain of salt because wasn't uh, Bradford pear was supposed to be a sterile variety of calorie pear. Things and, revert, you know. It's yeah. I always laugh about. I always, for an example, I always think back to Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Like if 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 you've seen the movie Jurassic Park and they're talking about dinosaur DNA, where they engineered all the dinosaurs mm -hmm. to be uh, female, or was, yeah, they were all females, mm -hmm. so that. There were no males, so they couldn't reproduce, but they were using uh, DNA from a frog, which converted mm -hmm. and then started making – like, they, they can convert. They can find a way. Yeah. Like, yeah. And nature and life uh, always finds a way. One of the pushes with Japanese barberry now is coming up with some sterile varieties because from a landscape function, oh, it serves a lot of purposes. It, it uh, can Very be – It's hardy. It's yeah. hardy. It can look nice in a traditional landscape. I think they look like crap. Yeah. But, but it, a lot of people look at them and say, oh, that looks nice. The deer don't eat it, and that's yeah. a big, big problem in a lot of landscapes it's, in, it's in the Northeast. It's hard to kill. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have, you know, because our native insects don't bother it. It looks like it's 
pest free, yep. you know, other than maybe like Japanese beetles or something like that that may munch on them. You, most people think, oh, the, the insects don't mm -hmm. eat them, which is an issue. Yeah. They're not thinking yeah. of supporting the right insects. So there are some pushes since it's proven to be invasive. There's are people who deny it's invasive, but it's proven yeah. to be invasive. Yeah. There, so part of the push is, well, it's got value to the traditional landscape. So let's find a way to make it non-invasive. There are people thinking like that, which is, um, I guess, a good way to think. I'd rather <laughs> make a non-invasive or, or non-sterile or variety than, but I'd much rather see them say, hey, you know what, let's not these even are, mess with this. Let's use a better plant these are, that's better yeah, for everything. These are great so, natural alternatives to that invasive exotic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's the the line of reasoning I would much rather see. Yeah. We're not really getting that, but I so would like to see that. What, uh, another one Nate mentioned numerous times, Nate from Mount Cuban yeah. mentioned a bunch, was uh, Canada thistle, which is also wind dispersed. Yeah. So it'll set seed, and then the wind just takes it and um, and um, blows it around like uh, that. And another another way that you might see these getting dispersed would be water, because some mm -hmm. of these plants like to be on uh, the banks of, of waterways yep. or so mm -hmm. forth. So something like purple loose stripe, Mm -hmm. Seeds easily drop in the water, go downstream, kind of hit a, a a bank, you know, a mile or two yeah, down the road, yeah. and it, it germinates there. So it's really easy, and that one spreads by wind as well. So wind and water, mm -hmm. um, that one that one can take over yeah. real, real easy. Now that's another one like that. They they realized that one was invasive in the mid nineties. Like mm -hmm. that's when it started to come out. So then they started coming up with sterile varieties, but you don't really see them around. So obviously yeah. they didn't work. Yep. You know, because that's that's 25 years ago they developed mm -hmm. some of these, and and you're not really seeing them. So yeah. then then uh, Japanese silkgrass is just kind of a pro at spreading because yeah. <laughs> it can spread dropping the seed in the water. It can cling to fur or or clothing if you're walking mm -hmm. through, and it'll the seeds will cling to you. Um, and then it can also spread like a, some a lot of other of these can spread mm -hmm. this way too, but vegetatively. So it's yeah. sending out suckers. It's spreading underneath the ground mm -hmm. rhizomatously. There's different ways to do it. And uh, and it'll send up new shoots yeah. through the root mass and not through seed. Yeah. I think I think when most people think of invasive, they think of it spreading rhizomally like bamboo mm -hmm. or spreading vegetatively. Like, and they're gonna see like it. Not weed. Yeah. yeah, where they they're watching it grow or mile a minute, something like that. Like oh, it's taking over. It can be a nice plant and mm -hmm. and still be invasive um, yep. by seed. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you, Tom, you did find it very interesting. Interesting article yeah. on weird ways, 10 weird ways that uh, invasives can spread. So um, the first one was just humans. Uh, like they, they list running shoes, but you could be uh, hiking, or hiking boots. Yeah. You could be walking through an area filled with invasives and carry the seed stuck to your mm -hmm. socks or your shoes or your clothing and, and you're dispersing it as you go along. So that's not uncommon that yeah. we and not, are the not carriers just for, that. for invasive species, but native species yeah, too. Exactly. There's like plenty of plants that they'll cling to like cling to your your um your clothes, cling to animal fur. Uh I'm sure if you've ever taken a, a walk through the woods and you you bushwhacked a little bit, there's a lot of things that'll that'll get stuck to you. Um yeah. so that's one way. Uh one that was pretty interesting was the whole fish industry with aquariums and backyard ponds and yeah. especially you, well the fish themselves can sometimes be invasive and but i would never even thought about doing this but there's people who say oh this fish is getting too big for my tank i'm just gonna go flush it or dump it in the pond oh i don't want to flush it so i'm gonna go dump it in the pond or dump it in the canal big thing in florida with like cichlids i know wow. there's like cichlids in all these canals and it's invasive fish but also sometimes the plants that um that they're uh, they're putting in these tanks, mm -hmm. same thing, some can sometimes be invasive species. And then on top of it, sometimes there'll be, I think it was zebra mussels oh. are transported through like aquarium plants sometimes. Wow. And then like the plant is now growing in your aquarium and you're pulling it out and then you dump it. And that's one of some of the ways some invasive yeah. plants can, can spread. So I'm, I'm jumping around the list of a little bit but the one that intrigued me was leaf piles and not so much mm -hmm. for invasive plants but invasive insects or exotic yeah. insects because we always talk about leaf litter and what it hosts for invertebrates well they can also host you know uh invasive plants can in, can host uh invasive insects mm -hmm. and if you're removing those leaves and taking them somewhere else you're taking that problem to wherever the leaves are going yeah so or if they're blowing down your 
your uh, property or you're putting them out in the street and they're blowing away mm-hmm. or somewhere else on the property, like in the woods. It's it's just kind of spreading that that problem as yeah. well. And I never thought about that. And I'm that just makes... reading a little write up on that. And it talks about the Asian jumping worms, which is an invasive species of, of animal um, that they're finding a lot in upstate New York. And uh, yeah, now that's where I'm going. <laughs> the vacation, so I'm, I'm going to keep my eye out. Yeah. But um, those things are crazy. Have you totally. seen videos of that? So uh, yes, yes, I was gonna say if anyone anyone lives in that area or they they see them around where they are, uh, post some of your pictures or videos that you have of them in our our Facebook group because those things are wild and I'm yeah. they're gonna show up here. We're close enough. They're gonna show up here within the next couple of years. It's just a matter of of when. So, wow. and one of the ones that was interesting to me <laughs> that was just above that was artificial Christmas trees. That one blew my which mind. I would have been like, oh yeah, real Christmas trees, because a lot of them are yeah. are non-native species, yeah. not necessarily invasive species, but non-native species. Okay, that makes some sense. And then they're going to harbor some non-native insects, which could potentially be invasive. But then artificial Christmas trees was because a lot of the times um, the the bases are made of wood. Uh, but a lot of times they're, or most of them are manufactured in China. And we talked about it, I think with, with Dr. Joe Calamy, yeah. that was how Spotted Lanternfly got here. It was just yeah. a landscape rock and an egg mass happened to be on there. So um, they found uh, with some of these shipments of, of fake Christmas trees, uh, uh, what's it, longhorn beetles, or what's it, brown fur longhorn beetles, which is a species with potential wreak havoc on native trees. And so far, they found 20 of them in these shipments. So since 1999. Yeah. But yeah, that was just an interesting addition to the list. So. Yeah. So, by, so actually, by using a natural uh, Christmas tree, you're actually helping to save the environment. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. Who knew? Oh, there's a lot. Of, that's actually yeah. a big debate, too. Yeah. I, no, we I know. We I, get side track, but, I, yeah, I said it jokingly. I said it jokingly. That, they are not, real Christmas trees tend to be better than uh than artificial trees right. i'm gonna throw one more out i will pick off the list um firewood they were saying that firewood mm-hmm. hosts a lot of invasive insects so you really shouldn't be taking it long ways uh you know things like um uh asian longhorn beetle if it's mm-hmm. if it's in an area that has it and you're transporting firewood into another area you could be taking those those pests with you yeah. so and the other two things that were on this list that were we've touched on, or one we've touched on a bunch, is uh, overabundant white-tailed deer. Yeah. Not necessarily that they're moving native or invasive species. Uh, I guess it stuff gets stuck with the fur, but it's more so that they are just overbrowsing on the native species to a place where those native species can't thrive, and it opens up so much space for invasive species that are there to take over or where they aren't to invade yeah so and then the last one was uh was shakespeare which i'm like wow <laughs> shakespeare's on the list and i guess fran already knew i this knew story. this one yeah and um it was a group that wanted to bring the the all the birds that were mentioned in shakespeare's works and there's 600 species one of which was uh the european starling which yeah which is a huge problem so yep. that's that was human hu- human stupidity yeah so that was a, that. a blog on nature.org from 2016 on uh, 10 weird ways you could be spreading invasive species and that we've covered six of them or so and that was from uh at the time matthew miller uh director of science communications for the nature conservancy yeah. so that was a great uh a great article and fun article too yeah i really enjoyed yeah. that one so uh what do you think does that that about wrap it up yeah so that's the big takeaways are just because it, when you hear something's invasive and you don't see it spreading, that doesn't mean it's not spreading. Um, it's just a huge misconception with the whole invasive species thing is that, oh, I'm not seeing it spread, so this one must not be invasive. We're thinking about it on an individual basis. And by, and, by uh, ignoring that, you're, you're not really helping the cause. Yeah. So yeah. it's, you know, it, it's a hard one. Some plants, there's an emotional tie, and I've had a listener mention this. Some, some people have trouble letting go of certain plants because there's an emotional tie or memories mm-hmm. And maybe that's something uh, I actually look to see if there's any kind of um, studies done, like psychology studies done just on on health and emotions and ties to certain, mm-hmm. not necessarily native plants, but just plants in general. Yeah. Um, because that's that's a strong bond to to overcome. Yeah. Uh, oh, you yeah. know, and I understand that. And that's why we always talk about you do what you can do in, in your space. Mm-hmm. We can't hold everyone to the same standard. So, I mean, we understand that. But as long as you know. Yeah. What the issues are. 
but uh yeah like just be knowledgeable yeah, exactly. and at least at least know mm-hmm. so i have no complaints at this, all fran this is amazing that you haven't had any complaints for the last like month now yeah two months i'm now. saving it up you just saves it for off the air all it's, the complaining that's going on <laughs> but, maybe that's it maybe i'm just you guys are my complaint <laughs> sounding board and I'm all I'm all like free of it by the time we do the recording. But you want to do a yeah, let's do it. Deck? So right. yeah, this will be a nice little pick me up after we just brought the mood down. And uh, I'm feeling a little bit like doom right now after all that invasive yeah. plant stuff. I'm just looking because some of these, uh, you know, share your morning nightly routine. Like I don't think that's. I w- I wake up. Um, yeah <laughs> yeah. How about um, my three favorite purchases this year. How about you? Let's make it one. That's, I was gonna say, that's a tough one because I bought stuff. I know I got an or ordered something off Amazon. I don't even remember what it was. I can do two. So I could do. Yeah. I can easily do I, two. I'll think of something. All right, so I'll I'll start with mine. One is I know we've we've ordered our shirts from our mm-hmm. shirt thing. We haven't yep. gotten them yet, but I know it will be one of my favorites, and I'm gonna wear them proudly. Mm-hmm. My other one was I actually purchased a digital business card at mm-hmm. the beginning of the year for sustainability purposes. It's one card that, and it works the same way. Like when you go into a store and you tap a credit card on the payment machine, you tap the credit card on someone's phone Mm -hmm. and all your contact information goes on there. So it actually brings up a link tree. It puts your contact information in their contacts um, and kind of eliminates the the need for a business card or a busy Mm -hmm. business card. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's a good topic for conversation. You can give someone your information and Mm -hmm. they're kind of, it's a, it's not so common right now, so it they have that memory of that. Yes, like yeah. and they're talking about it. So that was easily one of my favorite purchases. Mm-hmm. You know, it was relatively inexpensive too. When you think of how much you pay for one, the one card was less than a pack of business cards. Yes, yeah. yep. you know, and it's it's good for and you can change it yourself. You can have multiple profiles. I just think of the amount of paper savings mm-hmm. by doing that. Yeah. That was easily mine. So the. So this is something I haven't bought yet, but I'm going to buy. I just haven't like physically gotten it yet. And that's a, an electric chainsaw. Ooh. And um, oh, I'm going to make the leaf peop- the leaf blower people so happy right now. So, so there's a big push with a lot of these two cycle motors. They, they emit like crazy emissions yeah. um, that are very, can be very, very harmful. Uh, there's not a lot of regulation that goes into those motors as compared to cars and that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of them are, are fixed like here and there. It's not like you're taken to a shop where yeah. there is someone who has to abide by, uh, some kind of law. A lot of people just fix them themselves or they'll bring it to a friend that can, can tune them up. So they're not always, um, what's the, uh, the word up to code, I guess is yeah. the yeah. phrase to put it. But, um, but yeah, they, they have really bad emissions and you think about the purposes they're doing, especially with the, the leaf blowers. Yeah. I understand the 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 cries out and it's happening a lot in north jersey now where they're banning these leaf blowers because they're they're loud they're noisy and they're doing an ecological disservice by getting rid of these leaves yeah it's a a old school practice um to remove the leaves for so people can see your green grass and it's it's really damaging to um instead of like having the leaves where it can support a lot of insect life and uh and re basically provide a nursery for that whole system you're, you're completing the circle of life. So um, on the other end, it's, we've talked about tree removal being important for some of these, these habitats, especially with Nate last week. And uh, well, one way to do it is there's the electric line of chainsaws is actually like, they're pretty good right now. They're quiet. So you don't need the ear protection aspect of it. Um, They're lightweight and they can do a lot of the same work a regular gas powered chainsaw can, but and uh, I think they're a little bit more expensive, but I in the grand scheme of things, you're you're making a bigger impact using this than a uh, gas powered one. At one point, I did own a battery operated chainsaw, mm-hmm. like Ryobi with their one battery. Yeah, yeah. They actually make a small one that you can hook a battery to that you can still get like two inch to three inch caliper. Mm-hmm. Like if you're doing just like pruning or taking, you're not you're not cutting a, a huge tree down. Yeah, yeah. and that's do... that's for these electric chainsaws have been around for for years, but um, they've always been kind of smaller scale. Yeah. Now they have some like actually fairly large scale versions of these these chainsaws that where you can cut down a larger mm-hmm. tree. And um, yeah, I know a lot of people that I've that I know that use them 
really love them because they're quiet they're lightweight they can pack them in places and um and use them for a variety of different things not even just yeah. just cutting trees but still dangerous you gotta make sure that you're you're paying attention it's not like it's a toy versus a, you something that really hurts you you but. don't want to cut the line like you you still yeah. have to be like yeah. extremely careful exactly. if they can cut a tree it can cut you exactly so. but yeah i've been uh I've wanted, I've been talking about getting one since January. And then I was actually looking up saying, okay, this is what I'm going to get. And I'm going to go get it. Probably want to get back. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, that, that will be so, a great purchase. I yeah. think that was some great purchases. We're actually about right about an hour. Yeah. Right around yep. there. So no, we did good. good. We did good. So, so with that, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to this edition of the buzz. Thank you everyone for listening to native plants, healthy planet presented by Pylons nursery. We're giving a great big thank you to RJ Comer for our buzz theme music. Make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland nursery, Facebook at Pinelands nursery and Instagram at Pinelands nursery or native plants underscore healthy planet. Um, and YouTube at Pinelands nursery. Thank you for all the great phone calls this week. For the question and comment line, call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that, 215-346-6189. Ask a question, leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, well, we will. We, we play them all. <laughs> yeah. we, I, we never not play at the At some question. point, we will get overwhelmed, and we're going to have to – to pick, to the, best pick ones. the best ones but right but now right now if you call in and you're you're probably going to get on the air unless you say something that's just complete we even play saul's call so I'm yeah <laughs> yeah have... we've never we've never not played a saul call you yeah. you've heard all of them so um we'll make sure that we play it and we we answer it or or comment on it on a future episode of the buzz and remember if you want to vote for uh tom's article or my article you have to be a member of the native plants healthy planet facebook group otherwise uh your vote goes uncounted unfortunately let's see if there's a contingency on other social medias that protest that want their their voices yeah. heard that would be nice yeah <laughs> yes, be it nice. Would. so as we've said before we now have have shirts all that money is going to uh, a lot of the, the nonprofits that we have on our show here. So uh, we aren't taking a dime. It's all going to them. And that was just another way that we want to get the, the group involved to give back. You can see that store by going to our website, www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. And there's a banner at the top that says like t-shirts here or something yeah. like that. Click on that. It'll take you to the store. And you, all that money, like I said, is going to a good cause. And we got a nice little sum that we're going to have yeah. to figure out where it's going. So when we <laughs> do when we do make that donation, yeah. we'll we will make sure to let you know where the oh, yeah. money that yeah. from your purchases went. Yes, so. yeah. And there are two um, organization specific shirts that are up there right now. So uh, if you want to get a shirt and it goes to a specific organization, it's just those two shirts in particular. You can't request. Oh, I want this to go to so and so. Because frankly, we don't even see that like any quarter comments or yeah, anything like no. that. So, but um, but you can make your choice by which shirt you pick. Yes, exactly. So, as always, you can listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcasts. When you're there, do us a favor, subscribe, leave a review, and share this these episodes with your friends. Uh, we want to get them on the the native plant train too this mm -hmm. is a movement and and we just need more people uh involved planting native plants um that's our mission at the end of the day is people recognizing how important this is so we do and and we need your reviews like yes. we need your reviews on apple i don't under completely understand their algorithm but when you do a review we post higher in the rankings and if we post higher in the rankings more, more people, people can stumble upon us because yeah. they see us um if they search nature in nature or science, science or, or those kind of we'd things. be higher yeah. on the list so that the more good reviews you give us the higher we show the more yeah. people can so that's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, everyone who's listening should go on and just leave us a review so that more people can find us. Yes. And uh, if we don't have have five by our next episode, we, might have, to, we might have to pull the plug. We're going to no, <laughs> just joke around. We're never, we, we're I don't see uh, stopping this in, in the foreseeable no. future. So, so so we're at the point of the show. This is your turn. This, yeah, this buzz yeah. episode is your turn for a, so a, a secret. secret story. Yeah. And, um, and this one is actually about Fran and myself. Oh. And uh, uh, so for, <laughs> Fran and I, for, for work for Pines and Archer, we go to a lot of trade shows and um, we used to go to a lot more. And trade some shows them, are, are becoming a little bit of a thing of the past. Yeah, we I used think. to go a lot further, too. And yeah. in particular, there was one trade show out in Ohio called Sense that was in uh, downtown Columbus. 
in and January. In Jan, yeah, yeah, in January. So uh, we had this old, um, was it a Chrysler Town and Country? Yeah, minivan. <laughs> minivan that we drove and, out, and we loaded up with all the the uh, trade show booth stuff, and then we'd get there the night before and set it up. Well, this time it happened to snow like all the way there, and, and then we we're having car trouble. Yeah, it, it, it's like a seven hour drive for us. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, we we thought we would make it through the snow, but instead we were driving into the snow. Yeah, and then like so, there's basically a snowstorm mm -hmm. in Columbus when we're there, and our cars breaking yeah <laughs> so, yeah so we had to like go to an auto shop and we got some stuff and i don't i don't even know it we eventually took it. it to a shop and got it fixed but someone it, gave us a great recommendation on somewhere locally that we could have it fixed yeah but anyway whenever we go to these places we try and find like the local um like hot spots to go to eat and what what's helpful is your your brother steve yeah. went to ohio state which is in columbus also in columbus so he gave us some great recommendations yeah so we went to first we went to a place called thurman's yeah which is a, a like dive bar burger joint which was awesome that and, was not featured on man versus food yeah I it's believe. been on man versus it's been on a bunch of travel shows it's kind of like it's like well known in that area a huge great burgers which and then they, that was phenomenal the second place we went was uh um it's the it's the it? german schnitzel house yeah i'm thinking that there's a place near us that's a schnitzel house that's the name i was thinking. i think it was called i think it's called the german schnitzel house i think yeah i'm gonna have to look that up but it's um so when we're there they had like a oh it's uh schmidt's sausage house oh that's it all right and uh so when we're there <laughs> they had like a, a buffet of all the things i couldn't pick what i wanted so Fran got like a, a big I, kahuna sausage I, burger, which yeah. was literally, it was like a sausage that was the size of a hamburger. Now we started out slice. with appetizers and yeah. the beautiful thing about the appetizer was that the waitress refused to take <laughs> plates with food. Yeah, there was <laughs> So it started by goading Tom saying, you have to finish the appetizer. Yeah, there was like, it was these pretzel bites and there was yeah. like two pretzel bites left and we, neither of us wanted them because we had like big meals ahead. Yeah. And then she's like, I'm not allowed to take anything until it's all gone. My hand has been stabbed with too many forks from grabbing <laughs> plates too soon, which meant we were in the right place. Yes. And um, so, yeah, so I had like the buffet and Fran got like a burger, but it was like a little sausage. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I got one plate and then I didn't realize there was like a whole other section of the buffet that I missed. So I went back and then like loaded up my plate again. And uh, and then so then I was sufficiently full. Tom thought the meal was over at that yes. point. Well, and, right by our table. <laughs> One of the things that Schmidt's Sausage House is known for is their desserts. So right next to our table was this whole display of cream puffs. But yes, they're not yeah. – these cream puffs were the size of individual birthday cakes. Oh, yeah. And as a <laughs> – you know, I will say that if I get a dessert, I'm not sharing a dessert. Exactly. Except yeah. with Me maybe – yeah. That's like, like I'm manly getting my, pride. Yes, you can't do that. I'm getting my mm. own dessert. So Tom tried to refuse, but the waitress and I both – <laughs> said that that was not an option <laughs> i really got peer pressured into having dessert too i was like literally like very full and then i was forcing the dessert and fran had gotten a like a german beer that had like this raspberry liqueur in it it was and, a it was a sour beer that they had at raspberry liqueur and it looked really good and basically i was like i can only get the beer or the the cream puff i cannot get both and i ended up getting both <laughs> <laughs> then, then i went into the bathroom because i thought i was gonna throw up in the bathroom and i didn't um luckily and then i walked outside to go but get back in the car and we're like literally about to open the car and i'm like friend i need a minute <laughs> i ended up throwing up in a snowbank and, and it was all because friends and peer pressure and i to... stood behind the car and just laughed yeah. because... <laughs> because... and it was it was just hilarious being in like in the snowstorm we're literally like bahaing with the i guess baja's in the sand we're bahaing through all these snowbanks with this yeah. broken down minivan in yeah. the middle of columbus ohio and eating to and, the point where we have yeah. to purge yeah exactly it so was... That was memorable. That was a great, you know, just the fact that the, the, that was peer pressure at its best. Yeah. And it's one of those, it's one of those situations where at the moment it was not a lot of fun because I felt really sick, <laughs> but like you get, it's like the multiple layers of fun that uh, the guy, Steve Ranella from the Meteor podcast talks about a lot. And it's, you have things that are fun at the time, like riding, well, not yeah. for me, but you go on a ro roller coaster. A lot of people, oh, they're having a lot of fun, but you aren't looking back 10 years later saying, oh, remember the time we went on that roller coaster and how much fun we had? No, you're having no. fun at the moment. Yeah. But it's the things that like really suck at the moment. You look back on any lab, you get so much more enjoyment over the years by looking back on it and, and enjoying it. So, and, yeah. and that would that dessert was worth it. Oh, definitely. That, that and dessert, the beer was worth it. The too. beer, the, the whole experience was, worth it. was yeah. worth it. That's a we great. Went, we went back the next year and had a much more reasonable meal. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> 
honestly, I'm a bad influence and I'm not one to like when I go to a restaurant, I'm a like we're both foodies. You oh, want yeah. to experience yeah. everything they have and I'll I'll be a glutton. I, I don't mm -hmm. care. Like I'll I'll eat it all. But I was not eating all that. Yes. But yeah. then pressuring you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was my own. It was my own fault. But with that, we want to thank everyone again. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone. We will see you uh, next week with a meet the guest episode. Um, I'm pretty sure it's confirmed, but I don't want to say who it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to be it might be a little similar to the Mount Cuba one. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll it's another another one from our original list that we're kind of embarrassed we haven't had on yet now that we're yeah. 60 episodes in but we're finally, we're finally get, getting around we're to finally it. getting to it so but we'll have that one for you next week until then keep it native Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.